Welcome to the HR Think Tank, a podcast that uncovers the power a trusted workforce has on team performance, culture and morale. We gather insights from experts, business leaders and HR professionals to help you lead your team. Here's your host, Kai No, CEO and co-founder of Verify Now. Did the 2020 pandemic shift the way we work or did it just accelerate it? In this episode, we chat to an exciting Australian company about their experience of adopting a remote first approach to work. What were some of the key changes forced on them? Why did they decide to keep the remote first approach? And how has it impacted the company? Our guest today is Shane Duffy, the CEO of Employment Innovations, one of Australia's leading HR and payroll companies. He joined Employment Innovations in 2008 as the HR consultant, then head of the HR practice before being appointed as CEO in late 2016. He now works remotely the majority of the time. This remote first approach has meant more quality time with his young family and he's loving it. Welcome to the show, Shane. Thank you, Kai. So there are many companies uh, at the moment who are starting to get the teams back into the the physical office environment um, with mixed results. I want to understand why you, uh, as the CEO of EI, decided to keep the remote first approach. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Look, we, like many companies, we ought to rapidly move into a remote or flexible remote approach uh, when COVID uh, started around this time last year. I think it was quite early on, well, probably even the first month of that arrangement when we started looking at the, the, the benefits and, and the, the positives of that type of working arrangement. And we thought, look, let's, um, let's just look at it properly. Let's do a lot of research into it and, and make a decision on, on which way we're going to go permanently. And it was pretty early on, probably in the first two months, that we decided that now, there, there, are, there were some negatives, but we thought there were solutions and, and ways around those negatives, but certainly the positives outweighed those and it was something we wanted to make a permanent move towards. I've been to your office. You guys have pretty like lots of office space. I mean, was it daunting sort of seeing this empty office space with majority of your workforce yeah, abroad was, and then making that decision to say, well, hey, you know, yes, we have this space, but... We're pretty happy with what we've got at the moment. Yeah, look, we, we have a good space and, and we're hit with a double whammy actually because we just took on the whole new floor um, in our you know, office in Sydney and uh, we were subletting out half of that floor to another business and unfortunately they, they didn't last long. They went um, into administration in the first, say, two months of COVID. So we were left carrying the whole floor's uh, rent. So we were hit with that um, at the same time we weren't even using it. So yeah, it's it's a, it's a space, but what we've got to now rethink is that you know, we, we rethink what that workspace looks like. We still have the workspace, we still will use it, we still go back there regularly. Some people use it more than others. But now rethinking that space and what we can turn it into is, is still where we're, where we're up to now. And in terms of the decision-making process, um, walk me through that. Like, uh, you know, you and your executive team and your employees, how did you come to the decision that, hey, we're, we're actually going to keep this remote-first approach? Certainly, well, uh, you, you listen to the employees and, and that the feedback there was, you know, for, for most people, was overwhelming that they, they were enjoying that way of working. I think the difference back then was that we were permanently remote. We didn't have the opportunity to get together for one day a week. So it was a lot of people were still feeling a bit apprehensive about the fact that they were permanently working from home. But those the overwhelming view was if we were allowed to have some localised interaction balanced with working from home the majority of the time, that's what the majority of people wanted. Hmm. So certainly on that side, we, we garnered the, the opinions of people there. On the other side, we had to make sure that we could do it in a productive way, uh, that customers wouldn't be impacted. We could still effectively onboard and train new staff members and, and communicate and, and be effective in meetings together. So uh, once we went through all those different things, we realised there were solutions to all the things that we thought were too hard. And um, and we thought, let's give this, a, give this a red hot go. I guess from a work culture perspective, uh, does that the flexibility and the understanding of where you're going has that helped with staff retention as well? I think it's it's difficult to gauge staff retention at this early stage because I think throughout the last twelve months there was obviously a lot of uh, people weren't moving in their roles as much as they probably would have in previous years. But I think that we measure employee happiness regularly. Mm-hmm. Uh, we gauge it. We collect feedback from staff through uh, using tools we have, and uh, we're, we've, our happiness score hasn't been has never been higher. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing. I think cult, culture is a is something you've, you've got to force a few initiatives a bit harder when you're remote first than if you're in the same office environment. So we do have to force a few initiatives around um, having s- virtual social events and things like that just to make sure that there is um, enough sort of personal connection outside of work as well. I'm super keen to explore what that looks like. Um, but before we get onto that, I-, I wanted to ask you, how do you build a strong, effective team 
uh, with a remote first approach, particularly for new employees? Yeah, look, I, I, the way I look this is I'll probably flip the question around and I think you don't, I don't think you can successfully work uh, with a remote first approach without having a strong, effective team in place to start with. So I think that's the first thing to have in place before you're going to embark upon something like this. And I think the foundations of a strong, effective team are really right people. It's been mm. said before, right people, right seats and accountability. So um, in simple terms, that means hiring people with the right values and behaviours, mm. um, matching them with roles that are aligned with their strengths. There's a, a concept in a book um, by it's called Traction by Gino Wickman that I, it's one of my favourite books and it talks about three things you want to sort of tick off for every employee and that is okay. do they get it do they get the role they understand what's what's required of them do they want the role the second point and do they have the capacity to do it do they have the skills and the time to be able to do those roles and that once you've got those things then you know you've got the right person in the right role um, and lastly having a really good accountability chart or structure in the business that allows for individuals to delegate and mm. for for them to elevate themselves where they can by delegating work. I think those they're the key ingredients that you can't really build an effective team unless you've got those foundations in place, first of all. Yeah. In, in my time, you know, uh, working for, for various companies in different roles, um, prior to 2020, there was a lot of, uh, I guess, talk around, you know, do we trust our employees to, to work from home and be able to do their job? So what's the role of trust uh, with, you know, a hybrid or a remote first approach because there are many businesses who, who still have staff who are going in one or two days a week or three days. But what's the role of trust? Yeah, look, we have to trust each other to work uh, productively in a remote first environment. We, we trust our people use all the benefits and flexibility that a remote first approach offers uh, to deliver the best possible work for the business. But we judge performance on attitude aptitude and results, not on the hours spent online or, or in the workspace itself. I guess part of the... the trust building component is spending time with each other you know you, you talked earlier about having some of these uh, digital meetups and i know you and your team recently had a on-site um wh what are some other initiatives that ei takes to help foster that trust between yeah. the team members yeah i think trust trust is definitely built on um, open and honest communication so we as i said before we, we do collect a lot of confidential uh, virtual suggestions and, and obviously through the happiness survey uh, we get a lot of feedback from staff on what we could do better. Yeah. And, and we, when we openly discuss that feedback too as a company and, and obviously action where possible those, those, sort of, that, those sort of initiatives. I think um, no, trust as, as well can also be fostered through uh, living and breathing your core values okay. and purpose. Uh, not is, just is, that, is that responsibility on everyone or are you saying specifically for leaders? Well, it does start with leaders, but I think certainly you, know, you, you want to see the, the values and behaviours instilled in all employees, but mm. certainly it should start at the, at the leadership level and, and work its way down. I think um, if you don't see the, the living and breathing the values and purpose on a day-to-day -day basis, what is the purpose of having those values and, and behaviours in the business in the first place? Mm. So living and breathing them, yeah. it means that you're authentic. You say you, know, you do what you say you're going to do, and I think they're really important ingredients. Now, to change things up, uh, I want to know what does trust through compliance look like? That's a good question. I think, um, and we talked before about the foundations of trust, but I think, um, I really think, no, you can't really, or you, you'll lose trust very quickly um, if you fail to take compliance seriously. Um, that, that can be across HR, privacy, payroll, compliance, and also safety. Uh, th these really are the foundations of trust in any business, but um, they simply can't be enough to rely upon, obviously, but they are. if, if you're not sort of upholding any of those um, areas of compliance, then trust is going to be very hard to build. For organisations that heavily rely on this approach, what are some of the risks? The, the risks of the risks of, of, of only relying on building trust oh, only and compliance? Oh, look, no, um, I think yeah, you need to build upon that. I think, you, as I said before, you've got um, other examples of how trust can be built beyond just the, the core compliance areas is, is through you know, living and breathing those core values and, and your purpose. I think there's also um, an element of... Now, authentic leadership, which plays a big role, yeah. um, that's really comes down to being respectful, being open to diversity and inclusion, um, having strong emotional intelligence as a leader, and, and that really comes up being a great listener and also being good at coaching in the workplace. They're all important skills of a authentic leader, and when they're done really well, they build upon that, le that level of trust that, that your workforce will have. Can you talk us through some of the major challenges that you had in, in your first 12 months as CEO stepping up to this role from speaking to you, I feel like you've got a really strong uh, ability to 
like people management skills. So I think that definitely was one of the core strengths that helped you succeed in the role. But talk to me about some of the major challenges that you had in your first 12 months. Yeah, I had a really challenging first 12 months, actually. I, um, we, we were, our business is broken up into a few different areas. Um, at the time, we were probably 80 to 85% um, geared towards being a labour hire um, outsourced employment business. That's where all of our revenue was coming from. And uh, t- 10 to 15 percent was was services hr and payroll services so we we're a completely different sort of makeup of business back then and um the labor hire business in that first 12 months we lost a number of key contracts for for a few reasons in the space of six months and put the business under a lot of stress um, profitability wise um, at the same time we were we had a lot of employee turnover um, our marketing budget was probably next to zero because of the pressures we were under and due to the high turnover of staff, we were having uh, a lot of issues with customer experience and you know, dealing with a lot of issues with customers. So I think in that period, I sort of went back to what I knew, which was you know, the HR, the people management side of things. So I I sort of, you know, probably because what, what I knew best. And I think looking back, it was probably what I think made all the difference. We started getting better at recruiting the right people. We put in a stronger organisational structure that allowed for people to take on more ownership of their own work portfolios. Yep. Uh, we got better at training and coaching uh, and we started working better across the whole business. And as a result, you know, we, the employee happiness improved. <laughs> and once we retained those employees and, and got them working well, that just flowed through the customer experience. And I um, honestly believe that tough period we went through, it, it just makes where we are now all the more satisfying that we went through, that we went through that tough period. Now, I want to read this quote that you shared with me because I I've really – Love this quote. Uh, I think it resonates really well with how I like to run business as well. So this is a quote from the former CEO and chairman of Southwest Airlines. He says, the customer is not number one. The employee is number one. Get it right with the employee and they will get it right with the customer. What's the role of leadership in cultivating this work culture and value? Yeah, look, I'm I'm such a strong believer in in, that quote, but but also the importance that the employee experience has over the customer experience Mm -hmm. uh, so much so that I've, I've worked towards having a combined um, employee experience, customer experience function at EI. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between the two disciplines as well. Mm. Um, we, we created both an employee charter and a customer charter, um, and that identifies our promises to both and how we'll live up to that on a daily basis. And people can question that where we've failed to live up to it. I think one of our core values is, is to create raving fans, and that extends to both our customers and employees. So... I think no, we, we, we measure both regularly. We measure customer experience, we measure employee experience, and we're trying to make those incremental improvements all the time. And I think having the function together, it's, um, I think it makes a lot of sense for us anyway. And I'm a strong believer in that, in that, um, that the theory behind employee experience influencing customer experience. And that's something I want to um, talk about a little bit more. I want to learn a little bit more about EI's approach for talent management, you know, from recruitment, onboarding to offboarding. Because when we first connected last year uh, you were talking about this book uh, titled the alliance managing talent in a networked age by reed hoffman who's a co-founder and was the ceo of linkedin you know you talked about tools of ju- duty tell us more about this concept and how was it applied at ei yeah look i've long long been a, a, um, a fan of and active, actively promoted ideas from from that book it's um one of the books i'd sort of go back to quite a fair bit what, what it means by the alliance, or I guess the ideal alliance in very simple terms is from an employer's perspective, you, know, you simply say, if you can help make our company more value, we'll make you more valuable. And mm-hmm. from an employee's perspective, it's, it's about helping help me grow and flourish and I'll help the company grow and flourish in very simple terms. And the concepts that, that I'll go into detail, not for everyone, but it's particularly really important for millennials and Gen, Gen Z, those mm-hmm. are graduates that have um, come on board since 2013. So you mentioned tours of duty um, uh, the language that you can use around that and you can give it different names, but we, we recognise there are tours of duty in the organisation. Um, the first one being rotational tours of duty, that is you cr- create an environment where graduates can enter into your business um, and prepare them for progression into expert areas. So on that front, we have got uh, we bring a lot of HR graduates through and we have sort of very clear HR pathways for them to develop they spend some time in, in Simployable, which is our, our labour hire business. They move into an advisor role where they learn more about the technical areas of, of IR and then they can move into a HR partnering role, which is where they ultimately do want to end up. 
The next area is transformational. So transformational tour of duty is where you can't necessarily, you might not be able to offer people the, the traditional vertical progression in an organisation that, that we used to have a lot of. It's it's where you get people involved in, say, cross-functional projects. Uh, and on their CV, instead of saying progressing through to certain roles, they, they can actually say they've been involved in certain projects and, and what the results of that are. And they're just as powerful being involved in those as, as it is getting a promotion to a certain role. So we try and offer those what they call transformational um, tours of duty. And lastly, it's a recognition of a foundational tour of duty, which is the loyal employees whose personal brand is, is so much so aligned with the companies that they're, they're almost the same, they're, they're in eclipse. And that, that's typically your leadership team mm. um, that you recognise you know, those sort of individuals and what, what role they play as well. How would this work for, say, an SME, you know, like a, a startup? Would tours of duty work for them? Is it more reserved for more established, bigger businesses? Well, I think I think it can work. A lot of the concepts that, that came from the book did sort of come out of Silicon Valley, the, you know, the home of sort of te- tech startups. So I think certainly when you dig deeper into some of the concepts beyond t- tours of duty, it also talks about um, network intelligence and alumni. And I think those concepts are really, really important for startups because you, you do have limited resources available to you potentially. So you need to be leaning on on your networks to, to help you. So the, the network intelligence is all about giving your employees time to build their own networks so they can use those networks to, to better the organisation. And, and the other part is you, by having people on tours of duty, if that next progression in their, in their career doesn't exist in your business because you know you're having honest career conversations and, and if you know what they're looking for in their next role but you can't offer that to them, mm. you leave on good terms, yep. you're prepared for it, then... You've got an alumni, you've left on good terms, you can always lean back on that alumni, people that have worked in your business and your employees can lean on that alumni to support them and for that network intelligence. So it's all, it's all about sort of connections and, 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 not, uh, and the connections you build, the personal relationships, being able to utilise them in the right way and not and, burning bridges. And that's, that's something that I saw. So in, in, in our research into you um, and EI, EI's got exceptional reviews on Glassdoor. What have you guys done differently um, to ensure you've got such a high level of engagement, but also talking about this alumni network and, and the offboarding strategy, like what what has EI done to make that work? I think if you go back to the, your points before around trust, I think you you build that credibility um, through you know, your, your people who've worked for you or people that have been connected with your business through not just um, how you treat your clients, that's certainly one of them, but you've got people that might be unsuccessful in getting a role, that how you've, you've, you know, they've been through the recruitment process but they've been, they're unsuccessful, how you treat them is also important. You know, that, that's, that's a reflection of you. And also when you have people that are exiting the business, either through resignation, redundancy or, or termination, you, you, you deal with them with their, their genuine tests of authenticity So, um, and speak volumes of how, how you're looked upon by you know, your, your group of employees and, and the trust they have in you. I think they're the qualities that, that really stand out when, 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 when you're being reviewed as a, as a place to work. I'm curious to know, you know, Shane, you, you as the CEO, um, now that you've got the remote first approach that obviously reduces the physical or face-to-face time that you have with your team, what do you do to, I guess, stay up to date with everyone and, and you know, have that rapport, that strong rapport that leads to these uh, amazing outcomes, whether they're still with the company or even when they've left the company? What, what actions do you take? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit harder. I think, um, I mean, whilst you might have still the time with each other's faces on, on Zoom, it's not, mm. not the same. Mm. I think um, for my team in particular, my leadership team, right now, we do still uh, get together um, you know, at least quarterly as a, as a, as a group face-to-face. Um, I do have, I, I find that with my direct one-on-ones that I have, um, the quality of them has actually improved through being remote. I think when I was in the office and trying to do them, there was too many distractions, um, and maybe they might have been missed. I've now got more sort of time, and and the, and the quality of those one on ones has certainly improved. So I think um, no, there's certainly an element of both. You, you know, you getting together, but also you know, making sure those those virtual or one on ones are, are better quality ones. Yeah. And where do you see this approach? Um, you know, looking into the future. Uh, dare we ask the question? But you know, five years from now. Where, where do you see this remote first approach going? I can only see it going more and more in this direction. I think it will probably go beyond the borders of just Australia. We might be start opening up our talent pool to a part of the world. Mm. Um, as we as we grow, I think that's probably 
Now you get these more distributed teams that are working in all parts of the world. I think that there'll be much more of that going on. Um, and and that's you no, know, you can't build a more di- more diverse workforce than that. So now I certainly can't see it going back in any way. I think um, I think it's only going to go forward more the more that technology improves that mm. sort of improves some of the things that we do find challenging. We certainly still find challenging. Um, you know, some of the brainstorming we need to do or the training and development of staff that are remote, they're things that technologies probably can improve us or make it better. So I think once those things start happening, you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't see more of it. So you're a CEO that is a fan of you know a hybrid or remote-first approach. For our listeners out there who um, don't have the same benefit of having a CEO who is uh, on, on, on that wavelength, what can they do to persuade or encourage their leadership to be more open to, to keeping this approach? Look, I'd hope those organisations um, have got, uh, there's, a, there's a voice of the employee that's being heard, which gives them the ability to sort of put forward these ideas and, and, and the like. I think um, no, if there's opportunities at all to, um, to work uh, remotely, even if it's only minimal, mm-hmm. um, no, practice the, the, the habits and I'll, I'll make them readily available so people know what these remote first habits are and if you're practicing those um, yourself as an individual, you're not. You're at least um, putting yourself in the best position. That um, even if you're doing it for a small amount of time, you're you're being included as much as you can, and, and you're being seen and heard as much as you can. So I, I think there's there's certainly benefits in sharing the the remote first principles um, with your business if you are getting the ability to work from home in even a small amount of time. I want to move to talking about uh, you know alignment between company values and employee values. Recently, EI you know, set up two core CSR partners um, that are aligned with your mission of making employment easier. And, and one's the sweetest gift, which supports transplant recipients and people living with chronic illnesses by providing a stable, flexible and inclusive workplace, uh, something that people take for granted. And the other one is a Black Dog Institute, which provides vital mental health research and services to Australian businesses and their employees. I know that you're jumping out of a plane tomorrow as part of the CEO Skydive for Mental Health. Why, why are these CSR partners for AI? Yeah, look, it's, I'm glad we went down this path. So it's one of the things that I'm re- we're really proud of and instills a lot of pride in the team and we're, we're, we're really proud of these partnerships. And we only just entered into them prior to Christmas last year, something we've been wanting to do for a, long, for, for a while. And the key for us was finding some partners that really did align with our purpose of making employment easy. And I think we did that with these two. The Sweetest Gift is an amazing charity, um, you know, really close to our heart in creating employment opportunities for those that are would otherwise be uh, probably disadvantaged and not mm. not had those opportunities due to their you know, um, their conditions. I think how our idea is we want to make employment easy, we want to make it more accessible to people. And I think that's one thing about remote work is that that's also creating employment opportunities for people that might have had difficulty getting into the, the physical workspace, people with mm. disabilities and things like that, So, or people with carers' responsibilities. Mm. So that sort of speaks volumes in that area there, and it's a great charity, and, and we're getting right behind them to help them uh, build their first restaurant, wow. and um, we'll help them as much as we can in the, in the areas of HR great. payroll. Yeah. And the, the Black Dog Institute, well, more well-known, much larger. Mm. I think we, we did some work with them uh, last year. We were really impressed by the quality of their research and, and programs they put into the workplace. So we wanted to make sure that, more businesses in Australia had access to those same resources. So we're getting behind that because we want to make sure that employment is easier for those that have those mental health challenges. Mm. Um, many people know people who have been through tough yeah. periods like that. So uh, we've got right behind that and we're, we're you know, getting as much funds as we can through ourselves yeah. or through our partners to, to help fund those in vital programs. And that kicks off formally uh, tomorrow with the CEO Skydive down in Wollongong. Did, did someone set you up for that or did you put your hand up and say, okay, I'm going to do this skydive? No, we, we'd started the partnership and then I, I would say within two weeks of that being formally announced, they threw this concept our way. I didn't know it was coming. Uh, so I thought what better way to, to kick it off. I can't really say no, I've got to get in there and, and give it a go. It's, it's a bold and courageous move, you know, something I guess uh, you as a leader possess. So it, was, it, it may have been... Slightly difficult, but overall it was easy for you. You just you just went with it. Well, let's just wait and see how I feel when I wake up in the morning. I, <laughs> well, tomorrow, you know, I'll, I'll definitely be keen to see the photos and, and see what that looks like. Is there going to be video? It's going to be a lot of video, okay. a lot of media there, so um, we'll get some good coverage. And the whole thing uh, from top to bottom is going to be videoed, so there'll be plenty of things to right. share. 
Yeah. I, I do I do wish you the best for that tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't envy your position, but I do wish you the best with that. AI offers services and HR and workplace advice, including employment law. Let's talk about how businesses can manage employee redundancies and terminations with dignity. What does this look like when it's done well? Yeah, as I said before, I think uh, it, it, it goes to the heart of your, you know, what, you, what you're like as a business. And I think you know, situations of redundancy are never great. Um, it's for no fault of the employee generally. And um, uh, you've got a lot of uh, things to manage when to do that really well. Um, you've got your legal obligations, which is probably the, the easiest part when you've got access to advice to do that part of it well. But sometimes it's just a little, little touches you do a bit differently as well that just... Um, you know, such as you know, providing um, maybe some, some extra ex gratia payment to see the person through a bit longer than what the statutory minimum is, um, giving them access to, to use your, your computers or, or equipment to, to find a new job, access to references and, and you know, opening up your networks for them to find um, jobs. So doing everything you can for them beyond just the, the, the minimum requirements um, is what you know, we try and do. You never know when that individual might come back as, as an employee mm. or might be a client one day. They're all advocates. They've all touched your business, so you want to make sure that they're they're looked after. And and we just talked about mental health. Um, uh, That's that's another area of this as well, managing that really well. We do luckily have access to, uh, our employees have access to employee assistance programs and and making sure they're available to the employee post-employment as well. Yeah, and I think that's really important if um, you you want to have an alumni network or ambassadors of your company, how you treat them on the way in should be how you treat them on the way out, which is awesome. Uh, making sure you look after them because I think that says a lot about you as a business, right? Yeah. If they're suddenly uh, less value to you because they've decided to go somewhere else and then you change the way you treat them, it doesn't send very good signals for your future employees, does it? No, that's right. Like pe- people have made a decision to, to leave and go for, an, uh, for another job. As I said, ideally through practicing the alliance approach where you're having those honest career conversations, mm-hmm. you're not going to be shocked, hopefully. So that's one one of the benefits of that. But if you, know, if, if you do have situations where people are, are making a decision to move on, um, no, there's. I mean, you, you can do your best to, to try and keep them, but you've got to accept their decision they've made and, and treat them well. Before we wrap up, uh, I want to do the fast five questions with you. It's an opportunity for us to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, short and sharp responses are very much appreciated. So you ready to go? Yes, let's do it. What was your first job? Look, my first paid job is quite an interesting one. I, I was... Um, I was 15 or 14, 15 years old, and it was the Helensburg Fair, which is my local town. And I was actually the LJ Hooker bear. I was in a bear costume at the fair. I got paid $50. And I don't think I realised how difficult that was going to be on the day when I accepted it. It was going to be, it was nearly a 40 degree day. And I had kids coming up to me from everywhere. And I think um, I had to work really hard for that $50. That was my first paid job. Oh, nice. Who knows? You might uh, fall back on that mascot you know, <laughs> uh, approach. Uh, what's something interesting that's not on your CV? Well, I haven't actually put a CV together for a little while, uh, luckily. But look, there's one thing I did um, do. I'm, I'm not sure if I'll put it on my CV or not, but I did do a um, about seven or eight years ago. I did, did an agile IT project management course at Charles Sturt University because I, I wanted to see um, how those concepts of agile project management might apply to HR. So I think um, whether I put it on my CV or not, but it was something interesting I sort of did I thought did I could work? bring back to HR. Did Look, you there, was, there, was, no, there was some really good concepts there and I think um, I think uh, it's I think from the agile project management style it can adopt in a lot of areas of business. So that was sort of something different I did um, back then and I, I, I probably may put it on my CV actually because <laughs> it's because it's different if I had to. What advice would you give your 18 year old self? Look my biggest regret um, from growing up was that I, I graduated, I went straight into a role. Um, I didn't take time off to travel. So I, I think if um, I was very close to doing, I was very close to sort of quitting and, and spending some time over in Europe. And I got convinced to stay and not do that and, and, and do another degree. But I, I actually would have, in hindsight, I would have would have done more travel. I would have got that out of the way and and, and came back and resumed where I was. So I, I do look back on that with a bit of disappointment that I didn't spend more time overseas. And now, if anyone's considering that, it's quite hard as well. <laughs> Definitely right? hard so. now. And I think now that I'm a lot older, I missed all those opportunities as you're younger and travelling at the same time. So it's um, it's the fun part of, I've, I've missed out on there. What book is a must-read? So we've spoken about The Alliance. I would recommend that one by Reid Hoffman. Um, I mentioned Traction, which is a book by Gino Wickman. We use a lot of those principles at EI from a leadership point of view, how we run the business, how we run our leadership meetings. So I think there's some really good good things out of that. The third one for the, for the people in HR, or even if not in HR, if you're in client management, there's a book called 
best kept HR secrets. And it's a really good read. You can pick it up and, and, and go with it. There's some good tips on 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 how to manage stakeholders and clients and, and HR. So I'm a big fan of that book as well. And I'll share that with a lot of people. What's a job for the future that doesn't exist today? Look, I think there's two that I can think of that might be more prevalent. One is a innovation manager, someone who fosters um, uh, the ability for individuals in the business to come up with new ways of doing things to make small improvements and also big improvements in, in the business. I think there's a lot more to be done there. And the other area is probably a data scientist. And I certainly think in the area of HR, we'll see much more um, using predictive uh, analytics around predicting behavioural traits and who's going to be successful in different roles. I think they'll, we'll get a lot better at that and around data and, and how it's going to be used with with predicting people's and people's performance. That's definitely something that we're interested in. So, you know, we'll, we'll be tracking that as well. Shane, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for your candor. It's been great having you on the show. Thank you, Kyle. I've really enjoyed it. It's been great. Our guest today was Shane Duffy, CEO of Employment Innovation, one of Australia's biggest combined HR and payroll companies. You can connect with Shane on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening to the HR Think Tank with Kai No. We'd love it if you could subscribe and share our podcast with your network. As always, the resources and links mentioned will be included in the show notes and posted on the Verify Now website, verifynow.com.au.